Hi, everybody, and welcome back to yet another cracking installment of the Map Round Show. This is the Built in New York series. And with me on the line is Stephanie Dunn, the president of SBA Lending for a startup in digital banking called Grasshopper Bank. Stephanie, welcome to the show. Hello. Thank you for having me. Well, the privilege is really all mine. Um, so super excited to get into all of this. Um, so digital banking, it's, it's a very exciting idea um, and very excited to kind of unpack what you guys are doing. So uh, you obviously founded 2019. Um, but for our viewers and uh, audience around the world, uh, Stephanie, who haven't heard about Grasshopper Bank and the mission that you guys are on, why don't you paint a, a picture a little bit about your background and give us the origin story to Grasshopper Bank? Yes, well, I would love to. Grasshopper Bank, as you mentioned, is uh, headquartered in Manhattan, New York, founded in 2019 uh, by a fantastic group of very impressive I would say bank executives and entrepreneurs, which was really exciting to see that combination. And uh, we pride ourselves on being a client first digital bank. And uh, we are built or and pride ourselves every day on focusing on the business and innovation economy. So our goal is really to be a bank that is a digital offering and caters to business community. Cool. So lots to unpack there. What would you say is is the problem or the challenge that you guys are looking to solve for uh, for business businesses in North America? Well, I would say the big opportunity for any bank or or fintech or lending institution in America is really just providing access. And this is probably where my passion lies. Is uh, as an entrepreneur at heart and a, and an entrepreneur myself. Is so many times. Uh, banking can be intimidating to a small business owner, and uh, it's not knowing how to access, how to access and what's available. So Grasshopper Bank really tries to uh, provide access through digital channels, because that's the reality of the world we live in today. People need access digitally, because when, you know, when was the last time you went to stand in line at, with a bank teller? Uh, so we need to provide digital access, but also be relatable and relevant and uh, speak, talk the talk, I like to say. Mm -hmm. um, so why is access such a problem? And one of the things as we were touching on before we went live was, you know, I've been in the States for all of five months. And one of the things that I've, I observed was I thought the banking sector in general would be more advanced. And what was interesting as an observation is because in Africa, we have like some seriously <laughs> interesting <laughs> infrastructure challenges. Um, and so we're almost forced to innovate. And I would say that in some contexts, the South African banking uh, industries, especially from a mobile payments perspective, for example, is actually more advanced than the U.S. in some cases. So when you talk about access, what's the issue on the ground here? You're so right. And I'm originally from Canada, so I'm from Montreal. And I would say even Canadian banking is is advanced as well as European and international banking is much more advanced. And I'm not quite sure why that is, but in a, in the US, I would say banking has lagged because it has remained a much more traditional business. And it has remained a much more, I would say, again, access has been difficult. If you want to really sit down and talk to your banker, you have to physically go to a branch. And then when you're at the branch, you never get to speak with the person that you really are supposed to be speaking with because they're usually not there. So it's, it is behind from an access and information standpoint. And I would also say information is flooded online if you're looking for financing. If you're looking for to borrow money, it's very, um, I would say, confusing and flooded, and it's not uh, concise. So when I say access, it's knowing where to go and how to get it and what's available. Mm -hmm. So you're obviously playing in an SBA lending uh, capacity. What is uh, on your mind at the moment when it comes to, or what do you actually do from an SBA lending perspective? Is it the same as lending from a different bank? Like walk us through what you guys are doing there. Sure. Um, SBA lending is lending for uh, with a small business administration. So the bank provides the loan and then the government provides a percentage of guarantee on that loan in the event of default. And the government created this product many, many years ago because the government wanted 
to provide access to capital to small business owners and wanted to incent banks to mitigate risk and want to provide loans to small businesses. Before this administration uh, put that product in place, banks had to take all the risk. And so it was even more difficult for banks to really want to provide debt to a startup small business, for example. So it was a way for the government to in enhance or provide economic ambition. So our bank, just like every other bank in America and lending institution that lends and provides SBA loans, it's the same product. That's what's interesting. It's such a commodity. It's the exact same product, the same rates, the same terms, the same product. It's a government-backed product. The difference is, that once again, it's accessing the person who understands the product, can navigate with that small business owner, and takes the time to provide that thoughtful structure and the thoughtful loan solution and see it through. It is certainly a process. So same product bank-wide, but it's all about the people. And that's that's what I was alluding to before, I guess, we started was I, I think I have the answer to, <laughs> to, to, the, to the problem. <laughs> Well, one of the things we were, we seem I feel I feel like we should have hit record earlier because we were talking about uh, uh, some of the stuff I've been doing. Also, I mean, I think um, one of the headaches for a, as being a small business owner myself, and you know, I founded fourteen startups over the last twenty five years. When it comes, everybody takes on debt at some at some point, and I think there's um, there's a lot of um, hoop jumping and frustration and friction around how a loan is actually applied for. So you could, you know, you go to Cabbage, then you go to, um, uh, you know, another alternative lender, then you go to your bank, then you go to another, and every single time you're uh, being asked to complete a series of uh, fields or information, hoop jumping, <laughs> um, and they everybody wants different things, you know, and so it becomes like a huge headache if you straight, I just want it done for me. and I, I agree with you. I think there's an opportunity from a digital banking perspective to reinvent the way that an SBA loan is uh, is facilitated so that the headache, in other words, it's fast, I can get an answer quickly, and then I, and I don't have to deal with all this headache and frustration of trying to deal with everybody else's processes and systems. Sure, yeah. And I would say this, I would, I would relate it to this example. Let's say you're a patient and you feel all these different, you feel nauseous, you have all these different symptoms and you walk into a doctor's office and you tell the doctor, I'm here because I want a prescription for X. So you walk in with your own diagnosis and the doctor just gives you X and you walk off, but then you're still sick. It doesn't solve any of your problems. That's what you just described in a nutshell on the, the history over the last 500 years in entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurs go to go online or walk into a branch or pick up the phone and say, I want X, but they think the X is what they need. Not necessarily. Instead, let's flip it and let's have someone tell us all their symptoms. And then you press a button and that will show, tell you what prescription you need. Mm hmm yeah, that's the dream, isn't it? I mean, I just found some uh, some interesting stats here on like this what's going on with SBA loans in in North America. So, like only forty nine percent of SBA loans are approved at small banks. SBA loans only have a twenty five percent approval rate at large banks. Why is there such a difference? I'm not so sure. Maybe you can shine a light on there. Uh, thirty three percent of small business owners struggle or fail due to a lack of capital. Is what I was saying earlier. Like everybody takes on debt at some point. Uh, because of cash flow primarily um, and ultimately like if you don't get your hands on these loans uh, Stephanie like it can mean the end of your business so it's it's a really acute issue um, so I'm curious to get uh, your view on on that like for instance why are approval rates only 49% at a small bank 25% at a large bank for instance like you said uh, you know the interpret the interpretation or the experience is lots of hoop jumping right we're talking two different languages you're walking into my office speaking one language. I'm responding back to you in a different language. There's no connection and we are not meeting in the middle. And that's why, and that's the biggest problem. What is the problem for small businesses and access to capital? They're not getting it. So we're obviously 
you're doing it wrong, right? So if they're not, if 100% of small business isn't getting what they're needing, it's either they're asking the wrong questions or the listener's not listening. There's a disconnect there. So how do we, how do we solve communication issues, right? Mm -hmm. That's the question. So, um, so holistically from a banking products perspective, what are you guys in the process of building? What does the future it look like through what you guys are developing at the moment? Well, Grasshopper Bank is doing a lot of exciting things. Uh, we're, we're very much um, positioned to be a, a, I would say, innovator. And we are now and will continue to be uh, providing small business deposit banking. Uh, what we're interested in offering is ease, ease of use, fast account opening, excellent service, and being able to um, provide it all digitally. So in the last six months, we launched our uh, BAS, Banking as a Service, and uh, just having started this, we're already seeing thousands of applicants a month. So there's clearly a huge demand. Um, and I would say uh, we're going to continue to expand those digital offerings and expand the business checking accounts and business operating accounts in addition to the debt solutions. So it's both, right? It's listening to what an entrepreneur needs and set them up for success. That's truly what a bank's job is, is not to push a product, is to listen and set the borrower up for success. And that's, I think that's probably the secret sauce in borrowing money. For an entrepreneur to borrow money and for a bank to lend money is it has to be set up correctly so both parties succeed. And I love what you said about communication because you said you're an entrepreneur. So like, for instance, I think oftentimes it's not, it's not even about the utility of the tool itself. It's about who's facilitating the tool be behind the tool. You know what I mean? So for yeah. instance, if I walk into, if I talk to you, for instance, like, and I go, Hey, I'm an entrepreneur, I'm a small business owner and I'm in shit right now. Like I need to get my hands on cash. I need to make payroll at the end of the month, whatever, you know, we were expecting X amount of money on this date. We didn't get it. I'm in trouble. Can you help me? And, you know, historically, when you're talking to a business banker, they don't have a clue about your mindset. You know what I mean? Like being an entrepreneur, like they don't really get it. They're just a clerk. They're like, yo, give me your information. I'll plug it in. I'll submit it to the business, the credit department. And then when I hear back, I'll let you know. So they're just a facilitator, but they don't really understand the, the mindset of, a, of an entrepreneur, which I feel in many cases is really a key point of difference, right? Because I can get a checking account anywhere. It's a commoditized thing. And by the way, my experience is banking in general is a commoditized uh, idea. You know, I want to deal with people who understand me. Like they built businesses before. They're also entrepreneurs at heart, that they have an entrepreneurial culture. And that's why I choose them because I know that they will get me and they, they will bend their own systems to provide a service to me that I can rely on when it matters most. Yes, 100%. And applying for a loan or applying for a checking account shouldn't just be behind a screen. You click a bunch of boxes and you enter some information and you press go and hopefully you're approved, right? Uh, banking it is very entrepreneurial and the bankers that are successful get that it's not a science it's an art and so when someone comes in and wants to borrow money for their business I don't just gather five data points I ask them for all the information and then I'll dig in because they might think they need money for payroll which is what you said earlier but in looking through, my first question is, well, why can't you make payroll? And I want to understand what money is coming in, what money is going out. And oh, by the way, it turns out you have a receivables problem. So maybe you need a line of credit to manage receivables. You don't need money for payroll because that'll solve it on a bigger scale that then is a game changer. And now your business can really take off because that's what you needed. Yeah, absolutely. Just on the startup side of things, I've seen I see on your website, I've been uh, bringing it up for everybody, but when it comes to um, a startup specifically, <clears throat> there's obviously like a, a, a startup checking account. And then there's also um, 
from my understanding, venture capital and private equity uh, solutions too. So is this broader than SBN? And how, because remember, like for me, I think I had this conversation with a client of mine. They're based out in New York also, funnily enough. Um, and they, you know, when we talk a small business, it's not the same as a startup. They can be categorized as a small business if you look at something like a headcount. So like in the U.S., a small business, according to like standard industry classification codes, is like any business up to 500 people. For me, that's a massive business, <laughs> you know. But so, so when you say small business, what is a small business? So a small business for me is like a services business. It's like, yo, I'm, I'm a videographer. I'm a restaurant owner. I'm a, uh, you know, I'm in the services space. But when you talk startups, for me, you're talking technology enabled, the ability to scale, the ability to get you know thousands of customers, ten thousand customers with one platform, and 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 it's a different type. It's still a small business, but it's a startup. A services business is more difficult to scale. So a again, to our point around like culture and who you're talking to behind the screen of Grasshopper Bank, you know, to, for, to to engage with someone when you are a startup who understands when you say you are a startup founder, that they know what that means. You know. And it's so funny that you say that because I was actually uh, a panelist at uh, the Small Business Summit in Chicago, and that was my biggest point was, and that's again the disconnect of the language barrier that we have here. What is the definition of a small business? It is all relative, right? It's interesting because I have some applicants that have 480 employees, and if they walk into the number one bank in a the country, they're a small business and they will be directed to the small business department, which is interesting because in my mind, yeah, I think if you have 500 employees, that's a big company. Mm. So, and then vice versa. Well, so many times we'll have someone applying for a, let's call it a conventional loan, and they've been in operations for a month. So in that person's mind, they're not a small business because they're, they're opening a consulting company. And so it's all relative. Uh, and, and it's interesting. There's no clear definition. I guess if you look at, you're right. If you go to SBA.gov, the definition is less than 500 employees would be considered small business, right? But if all, what if you have less than 500 employees, but you're making $50 million? Is that still a small business? <laughs> no, that's called a champagne problem. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Exactly. So that's, that's one of the biggest, what we were talking about earlier is we're not talking the same language. So there's a disconnect from what you're applying for, where to go, and and how you're defined, and then what the criteria is for your class, right? And that's why I think there is no more, there is no definition anymore. I think now the the definitions have changed. Maybe those were the definitions in the 50s, but I think now it, there is no more definition. Now it's more about listening, understanding that person's ambition, business. And the whole story to understand, can they repay this or what exactly, what kind of an account do they need? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the other thing to say, it's, it's like, you know, if you're a small business and you want to loan, like the average loan, uh, according to my last information anyway, it was like around about $25,000. That's the average amount of money that a small business needs to loan from alternative lenders in general, on, you know, on, on average. But a startup that's like, yo, dude, I'm in the million dollar range. You know what I mean? So when, so maybe I'm curious to understand, so because most a lot of my uh, audience are startup scaling. How does Grasshopper facilitate venture capital, for instance? Is there a fund that you guys have? What does that all look like? The venture capital lending now, we are uh, in 2023 lending to uh, venture capital firms that are able to evidence profitability. So it's more so they have a plan, they're able to evidence profitability now because we're entering into that cycle in our economy and the and where we are in 2023. Uh, and then historically in 2019 and 2020, uh, we were lending to startup, startup venture firms. Uh, and those firms now have, have expanded and grown and have multiple products and continue to thrive. So I, I would say in the last three years in America, venture has been very strong. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've been flooded and I probably because we had a lot of catch up to do, right? Mm -hmm. So it only made sense that there was a lot of innovation and a lot of venture funding and a lot of venture opportunity and 
equity raises over the last three years. We're probably headed into, I just think, uh, into an economic adjustment maybe in 2023, 24, from a true uh, venture debt raise, trend shifting maybe more to equity again. There was a movement there where it was away from equity into debt. Mm. And, and it's just cyclical, right? I don't, I think the most important aspect to any type of borrowing, lending, or equity raise is understanding the stack and profitability. What it would cost of funds, right? What do you have to give away to get what you need? Yeah. And that's the same equation for debt too. And that's also a huge differentiator uh, in banks or bankers or accessing the information. It, borrowing expensive money or raising expensive equity could be detrimental to a startup or to any small business, right? And you're hundred percent correct. It's also I've I've also observed that. I mean, when I speak to, I mean, I help startups raise money, which is <clears throat> another conversation we should probably have at some point. Um, but they, uh, I, in fact, on this show, I have an ongoing segment around like, so you've raised two million. What was that like in the current market? Uh, you know, how have you structured the deal and so on and so forth? What was your experience? Was it harder? Everybody says it sucks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a horrible, horrible thing to do. I think just to, to deal with because you know, uh, as an entrepreneur yourself, that you're dealing with, you know, 10 things on any given day, hiring, firing, sales, marketing, global delivery, et cetera, building product. And now on top of all of that, I actually now need to be consistently raising money because if I don't get the runway, like it's over. Um, and so we're, we, you know, as again, as a founder, it's it's very frustrating to have to deal with all these different potential investors, right? You've got angels, then you've got family offices, mm. uh, venture capitalists, then depending on your size, private equity. And, and, and again, everybody's looking for different things. And it's just like, everybody says it's horrible. So I think if, if, if one knew that Grasshopper Bank was around as a startup founder and you were making, let's just say a hundred thousand, you know, whatever it is, profit a year, whatever the number is that I could reach out to, um, to someone who understands where I'm at is able to have a conversation with me that's actually constructive um, and that is um, focused on delivering a very specific measurable outcome for me and that can actually guide me to your point uh, Stephanie around like how to structure it so is this a convertible note is it whatever like is a debt is it a safe note and when I'm having those conversations for that person to go yeah that's the way you want to do it Yes, 100%. Our venture team is absolutely fantastic and also very entrepreneurial at heart and uh, a, a huge resource. I would say our job really as bankers is, in essence, we're like a librarian. Our job is to provide access to all the information and then what that end user chooses to pick should be all laid out very clearly in an easy decision and they decide which product or which avenue to go down and it should be very clear and easy simple simple from mm -hmm. both sides same with equity too equity and debt should if you had all the information it's very easy to sit down and be able to pick which is best and the optimal solution for the business mm -hmm. and what do you see currently trends wise i know you touched on some of them uh, a moment ago um, what would you say is the prevailing method in terms of structuring a loan for a startup currently? What do you see as being the go-to, you know, is a debt currently? What is it? Convertible note? Like, what do you see on the ground from your side? Well, I, you know, the two reasons any, uh, a small business fails is either they grow too fast or they grow too slow. And the key to either either problem is capital. It, it, everything else you can hustle through, right? Um, so I would say from my perspective, because I've seen all different avenues and all different solutions, I, I always position myself as this is, if, if, I w if this was my company, I, the decision is based on what's the cheapest cost of funds? 
How fast can I get it? And how flexible is it? And what are my terms of repayment? Mm. And I'm always just a hoarder of ownership. If I have to give away my baby, that means we better be raising the baby together. And that very rarely happens. <laughs> so, so I would say I, I lean towards debt versus equity partners or, or equity raise because I lean towards that. And, you know, it, the beauty of our country is that access to debt is available. Anyone can, that's the beauty of anyone can borrow money. You mm. just have to be able to evidence your ability to repay it. And you have to be responsible and conscientious about the ethical repayment uh, responsibility too. So two, two way pride. Is there a, like a sweet spot customer? So when does someone reach out to you? Must they have, you know, a million dollars in ARR or when do you go, yeah, come on in, come have a chat. We welcome everyone. I mean, I, my passion is small business and my definition of small business is a employee of one. And so uh, 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 an entrepreneur, sole proprietor who is a consultant or wants to open a bakery or has a passion for pizza or is a mechanic, or you know, I uh, take great pride in serving those who serve others. And so my definition of a small business that I like to help and I'm passionate to help is I like to be, day one, I tell them I'll be, I'm will be i gonna be your CFO for free and I'm gonna give you all the tools to, for you to succeed and all the access with the most competitive rates and terms you'll ever be able to find and set you up. To, for this to be fun for you and I get to watch and, and take great pride knowing I helped. So yeah, we, we, I welcome everyone to come in. If I could help them today, great. If there's, if I could help them in five years, uh, they, we always keep in touch. So it's, it's very much a, uh, a partnership. Fantastic. Um, so I want to change gears somewhat. Um, and, uh, you know, when you, you'll know this, like, building something, I mean, digital banking, by the way, is, is hard, heavily regulated, uh, you know, you have to innovate, da, da, da. Um, and I'm curious to learn from, from you, um, what would you say in the process of solving this hard thing, obviously you're going to make mistakes, what would you say has been a, a, a big mistake that you guys have made and as a team potentially, um, and what did you learn uh, from it? What comes to mind? Hmm. Well, I would say a challenge today is certainly people, finding good people, keeping good people, uh, understanding uh, the new, I call it post-COVID economy of remote work and being able to maintain productivity. And that, you know, like you said, yeah, we're very highly regulated. And so we, have, we rely heavily on our technology and so there very much is a challenge when your technology is spread all over the country now in 500 homes versus in an office, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so everyone working from home and, and balancing that work-life balance and the productivity, I think, has uh, it been impacted by the work hours now. Work hours now are 24-7, but not really because everyone is on a different schedule and in a different location. And so... I would say that's been an ongoing challenge to manage, to understand, and to make sure that it's as optimized as possible. But I would say that's probably every industry, right, is mm. manpower. Manpower has been the post-COVID, I would say, challenge. Yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting. The, um, the idea of, um, of the world that I suppose COVID has enabled, right? Um, in the sense of like a lot of the, what, so when I was chatting to a founder, uh, Stacey Allen, she's the founder of Reciprocity. So the, their whole thing is around uh, corporate gifting f when your your workforce is made up of primarily Gen Zs. Um, and it's interesting, right? So like um, I'm, a, I'm a native analog. So like I only know the internet, sorry, I only, I was born without the internet and then the internet happened. <laughs> yeah, um, and, and then obviously my kids, uh, I don't know if you have children, but 
like they they are like you know uh, digital natives so like they only ever knew the smartphone which is crazy for me to think about you know um and so like oh and i and i think about like you know my son franklin for instance like is he ever gonna have a bank account huh. you know what i mean maybe you'll have we'll like a, mer- a bank. yeah yeah like he's gonna go dad what are you doing I don't know what yeah. that is. I've got yeah. like I've got NFTs, bro, and I've got digital assets, and I've got Revel dollars, and I'm you know, and I'm making money every day, Dad, uh, yeah. gener- generating digital assets uh, on a smart on my smartphone when I'm 15 years old, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and he's cashing that shit out in like a in like a crypto wallet. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and 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 building an empire and no banks. Yes, I know <laughs> I, it. Oh, I know it. Yeah, I have eight year old twins, and I say, okay, kids. Mom's going to the bank and I walk into the bedroom, you know, <laughs> and then my son, yeah, eight years old, you know, you try to instill work ethic and you need to work hard if you want to buy something, right? And he's like, mom, I'm just going to trade a Pokemon card at school. I don't need your money. <laughs> Wait, what? You don't need my money? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, do you think about that? I mean, like, what do you, do you think about like what the future could be? Because, you know, I'm curious to get your view on that because, uh, like, are you even lending fiat at some, you know, and then what, what does that mean? And the other thing, like everyone's, well, a lot of people are talking about web three and, you know, what is web three exactly? Is it digital, digital currencies is blo- blockchain, you know, and maybe it's all of those things. Um, and no one's been able to really paint a clear picture of like what financial services looks like, you know what I mean? when it comes yeah. to digital banking, for instance. So, you know, if you think about decentralized finance, like there was that whole thing, you know, well, maybe I could lend from, you know, a hundred investors in a decentralized way, give them, uh, you know, a smart contract that gives it's essentially a digital smart contract of a warrant, you know, that yeah. they can execute at some point. So then, so then what? And then, and then by the way, like if that is the case, when does that actually happen? Because it seems to me like, especially now, like the crypto market's completely hammered. So with the yeah. FTX and so forth, you know, and so now it's like, oh, well, no one trusts that. If you say I'm a digital bank with, you know, crypto extensions or token uh, asset man, like whatever it is, like I'm going to be like, yeah, sounds dodgy, you know? Yeah. So yeah. the whole brand of Web3 is also done. So so my question though, uh, with all that said <laughs> is w- what do you see the future of lending being for a startup in the future big question but love to get your views yeah i would probably say you know the future is unknown but then you say the future is now right think Mm -hmm. about how lending and debt have transformed with crowdfunding so if you want to borrow or not borrow if you need twenty five thousand dollars to start up your business and your web designer or graphic artist whatever you need twenty five thousand dollars you could jump through all those hoops with John the banker and it'll take you X X amount of time and you feel like you're burning brain cells because he's asking you for stuff that doesn't exist and you don't even understand what he's asking for. You send it in and then you feel like it, inadequate because then he, you, he poo-pooed it because you sent the wrong stuff and you think to yourself, I thought I was pretty smart, but maybe I'm not so much. People don't want to know that or feel that they're not adequate, right? So instead, they just go to crowdfunding and say, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to avoid all that stress and I'm going to just raise some 25,000 there. So I think that ha- that really did solve a lot of the capital raise versus debt. And that was, that had an impact probably on those stats that you read. Right. Mm. And there's more and more and more of it because you know what, we're in the generation of, or the era of, I want it fast and I want it easy. So if you want it fast and you want it easy, you're gonna the fast and easiest way is you go on crowdfunding and you and you just raise a bunch of equity and you know what the there's even less stress on you because if it doesn't work out, it didn't work out, right? Mm. If you borrow money and it didn't work out, you usually are gonna have some type of a consequence there. <laughs> yeah, it's inter- it's interesting that um, I just also pulled up the the actual latest stats on crowdfunding, so. Hang on, where's my screen gone? Bring it back. Here we are. Um, well, anyway, this isn't uh, doing what it needs to be doing. Of course, you know, technology. All right, we'll come back to that, guys. But anyway, the, the numbers are uh, $1.1 billion 
Um, that's the total transaction value in 2022. I actually think that's that's small. I I Where would have thought that? here. Yeah, in, in North America, yeah. Crowdfund. Oh, that's actually Statista World. Oh no, here you go. Crowdfunding market U.S. dollars. This is better. See, it depends on where you get your research from. There you, uh, go. The, there you go. Global crowdfunding market is valued at 17 billion and projected to be 43 billion by 2028. That sounds more like the truth to me. Yeah. And even so, I mean, yeah, again, you're right. It's probably what, what the data points are. I think, you know, you, your question on where we're going to be maybe in 20 years from now, maybe it'll be barter funding. And it, it, cause we're getting more and more towards that. Like my eight year old who's trading a Pokemon card for something in return. Right. <laughs> and like you said, the currency, uh, the shift in, in a, a quantifiable currency now. Um, hmm. And I think we're maybe going forwards and to go back to barter, <laughs> barter trading, trading a service for another service or a good for another good that, we, that someone else needs. So. Or, uh, or an equity block for a different equity block. If you take this idea and become a billionaire, I'm just saying right now on air, because this is live television, right? Uh -huh, uh -huh. Uh, that I'm a 50-50 partner. I'm not <laughs> a great partner. I'll be an amazing value add. Uh, I can tell. I can tell. I mean, uh, <laughs> it's all there. It's all there. We just got to go out there and do it, right? Um, there you go. <laughs> so just uh, curious, in your background there, you have a whole bunch of fighting stuff, like boxing. So you, what are you doing now? Are you collecting memorabilia for fight? Like what's, what's going on there? Yeah, I'm very much uh, like I wake up in the morning and I will listen to my inspiration, alpha inspiration on Instagram. And I'm very much into a wake up in the morning and feel like I'm going to run five miles like Rocky, you know, and then it gets my juices pumping and I'm ready to go because uh, I'm all about the inspiration. And so my office, I try to I'm full of memorabilia and cool things and stories that remind me of amazing things that other people did. So it gives me some juju to go out and seize the day. Uh -huh. Do you follow uh, UFC at all? Yes, I do. I'm from Montreal. So ah. yeah, George St. Pierre is a uh, yes, of course. tremendous yeah. living legend of yes, the, of the sport. Yeah. There's a, I think the, as a UFC this weekend, I think. Wonder, yeah. I love it. Yeah. I love, I love all anything sports and I, I, lo I love fighting and I love, but all sports. Yeah, me too. I, I must say, like being in the US, um, like having the, well, firstly, being in the right time zone <laughs> kind of yeah. helps with the yeah. access for it. It's not like the super early start, uh, but yeah, yeah I, I love UFC. It's funny how there's a lot of parallels in my experience to uh, to the art of war, like going to war, fighting, and mm -hmm. being a business owner. There's a lot of parallels between between the two things it's suffering pain uncertainty you know win or lose like you have to win at all costs you know there's a lot of similarities there have you found that too yeah uh, yeah but and you know i would say too winners or losers the defining i guess difference is it's not about the end destination it's about the hustle and the thrill of the hunt right so the hunt is like 1% of the, the kill is 1% and the hunt is 99. And so I would say it's the same in entrepreneurship too. And, and that's probably why I've been so passionate about this career that I've had now in small business, because it's, yeah, I love to hear about what excites people and what mm -hmm. motivates people and what inspires them to go out and get theirs. Uh, same with sports, right? It's so mm -hmm. exciting to, um, to listen to great athletes. And what made Wayne Gretzky one of the best hockey players of all time, right? He was mm -hmm. not physically the biggest guy on the ice. He wasn't the fastest guy on the ice. And what made him him? Mm -hmm. Which uh, yeah. so that's, that always fascinates me. Other people's stories fascinate me. The, the, uh, exactly. That's why I do this show, weirdly enough. Um, and by the way, by the way, I love hockey. Like ice hockey is is so amazing. Like it's I never thought I'd love something as much as like rugby. Like rugby is like a religion back where I'm from. Yeah. Um, but uh, but like ice hockey is like a religion. <laughs> oh yeah. Down here, and it's amazing. It's incredible. Well, wait. If you have to go watch a hockey game in Montreal, you have to watch the Canadians play because you know oh, we right. did invent the whole thing. Yes, of course. I mean, yeah, you know. right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. Of course. It goes without <laughs> saying. <laughs> yeah. And then the Canadian ambition, you know, they came to America to seek the American dream. I can't fault them. I did the same. But um, I don't know if you watched this documentary called In Search of Greatness. 
No. I'm you need Google to watch it. that. It's fantastic. And it covers Wayne Gretzky, Pele, Rocky Marciano, uh, who else? Um, and it talks about what made these people great, right? What was it? And it's it's exactly, um, they all have the one thing in common is that they, they saw themselves on the podium. They pictured the play before they shot the puck. Hmm. And, you know, it's that whole, the power of the secret or the power of manifesting, right? Yes. Well, I think it's, uh, I think Conor McGregor also, you know, if you listen to a lot of his interviews and things like that, he, and when he speaks, like he can clearly, he's, he's, he, he, he you know, and in his mind, he's done the thing before he's done the thing. Um, right. And, and uh, it's like, and people often like, ah, oh, visualization doesn't work and, and that kind of thing. But uh, it's, it's like, if you're skating on ice and you want to like turn to the left, like, where do you look? You right. look to the left. And if, you know, and your body will go where you look. And so it's like, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to imagine, well, if you're visualizing the outcome that you want, that the mind would take you there. Right. And, you know, the same principle applies to business and to a small, a startup. Someone who has a dream about being the best restaurant in town, they don't think to themselves, this is going to be the worst restaurant in town. Mm. They don't think... I'm going to serve the worst steak anyone's ever had. And exactly. so anyone who would ever say that, I would say, okay, yeah, you need to, this is not going to be for you. It's not going to work. Because if you don't even think you're going to be able to serve the best food, then how are you going to run a restaurant, right? Uh, yeah. And then sure enough, when you believe it, you make it happen. You find a way to make it happen. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, exactly. Three feet from gold. Have you heard that story? Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's really what I, that's that's that, that's my thing. I, by the way, and I, speaking of things to watch, um, there's I don't know if you've had a chance to to watch it, but it's called Stats. I love um, it. Amazing. You love that. Yes, so well, good. It's good, eh? With Jonah Hill uh, and things like that, and it's yes. so, it's like I don't know. I've been I've been getting through it very good, but like I can only do like half an hour at a time because it's actually quite a lot to take in. Yeah, you know, around tools yeah. for success and things like that. So if you guys are interested, it's a documentary with Joni Hill, the actor. Um, love him as a as a talent uh, from Wolf of Wall Street to many other films. And then he basically interviews his therapist, doesn't he? Yes. And you know what really impacted me? And it, same here. I watched it. I'm the, like, I'll watch the whole thing once and then I'll go back and watch again slowly and then process. But I just like take it all and then I go back. And really what impacted me and, and for him, and then it applies to me and probably everyone in the world is uh, your shadow. Mm. Did you see that part yet? That yeah, bit? I did. I, I, I actually, I, I have watched that. And then I, there's a great, uh, I'm actually going to put a tools for success segment in the show now, <laughs> but, but, um, or resources for success. So, yeah, so I watched that. I thought it was really interesting. Um, and I, I I journal and there's a cool app called Day One. If anyone's interested, you can do cool things. It's free. Um, and I don't journal every day. I don't like. It's just I don't believe you should be such a maniac with yourself. Um, but like you know, when the when you feel like ah, I need to get something off my, you just start writing. And so I, I started writing about the shadow, uh, and well, started to. Oh, you did it too. Oh, really? I Amazing. Did. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. yeah. It's, w so maybe just to fill our viewers in, uh, what's the shadow for everyone? Just very quickly. Well, the interesting um, definition is everyone has a shadow of how you see yourself or your subconscious, maybe in the back of your mind, the naysayer, or it's telling you, you're not, you're not going to be able to do that. Or it's the constant nag in the back of your head that of self doubt, doubt of worth, what you're worth or how you see yourself. And so many people have body image issues. So that's probably that part of the shadow. But I would say even in, in business or in anything you do, it's in the back of your mind, someone, in, you hear a voice that tells you you're not as good as you think you are. Mm -hmm. And everyone has their own little insecurity. Some people, it's their weight or their image, or some people, it's their intelligence, or they have this one insecurity in the back of their head that just festers and it's there for life. Yeah, it's the imposter syndrome. Yeah. So um, I'm going to send yeah. you a copy of my book, uh, if you don't mind. Yeah. I'll, I'll just get your address. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I write about it because like I've had 
you know, really amazing people on the show, like Navy SEALs and New York Times bestselling authors and billionaires and people who've built and done amazing things, high performance athletes. Um, and every single one of them suffers from imposter syndrome at some point. So the shadow uh, is a tool. If you watch the, the documentary on Netflix of called Stats, you'll start to see how to work with your shadow because it's actually a really powerful idea. Um, so... Um, yeah, I, I love it. So thanks for, <laughs> for mentioning that. Um, Stephanie, uh, let's wrap this up. One more thing, and then uh, we'll let you go. Um, why do you do what you do? Like when you wake up in the morning, what gets you out of bed? Uh, my sole purpose for everything I do, for my existence, is to know that I made a difference and to feel that uh, the difference I make in the world to one person to just a random someone is by adding value, uh, feeling like I, I gave as much as I could possibly give to, to the universe, knowing that that was my responsibility. It's my, it's my, I could not imagine a life without thinking I'm here to, to give and to serve. And, and the one thing I have that I know I can help with is this. So I feel like I, I, it would be a shame if I didn't, use my tools that were given to me as a gift for good for others can i share a funny uh one final thing with you um so i've been doing this show for eight years done over 500 interviews um and every time i ask that question the, and you know i don't have like anyone on the show like i get pitched a lot um for hey like i got a great guy or great girl they're doing i'm like okay yeah but you know so i do a lot of vetting um, but the people that do get on the show, like, I do believe that they ha have reached a measure of success that I think other, you know, people around the world can learn from. And so I always ask that question, not all the time, but I'd say like 99% of the time, um, I ask that question, like, why do you do what you do? Um, and, and in all cases, it's about contribution, like every single time. It's like, and, you know, I actually think that when you when you're thinking about contribution not just about well self-serving capitalistic interests like i must get rich or die trying and you know uh, i'm going to be a gangster in my space you know um uh, i think there's a especially when you're young like you if you tell a 26 year old he can walk on water he'll believe you like i was that guy um, and I was only chasing money and I only ever got to a certain level of success. But the moments I shifted my mindset to, okay, I can do both. I can be on a mission and I can make a difference and I can, you know, become wealthy and, you know, and then, okay, so what does that look like? And the same thing with you guys, like digital banking, grasshopper, et cetera, SBA lending, da, da, da. Like, I do think that if you, if your motivations are really one of, are, are, are combined with contribution as well as other things, um, then that's when magic, in my experience, typically happens. Otherwise, people don't, you know, reach that level of success that they oftentimes aspire to. Yeah, hundred percent. And you know, we're when you think about life and the short duration that we're here, and so my in my thing has always been too, like, what's my legacy, right? Mm. And so uh, when I die, whoever is I uh, have had an impact on in my during my life is going to think of me. And what are they going to remember? Are they going to remember? Oh, that Stephanie, she was such a, she was so great in the boardroom. Can you remember all the contributions to our balance sheets? They're never going to say that, right? <laughs> They're going to say, you know what, that Stephanie, she was so passionate. She lived every moment and did everything she possibly could to live life to its fullest and pay it forward. That's what I want people to say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I'm going to definitely send you a copy of my book because I actually write about that because I, I think often, so I think what a, a great spectrum to evaluate a, a difficult decision is to fast forward your life to the end and then go, cool, so, you know, so here's the end and work it back timeline-wise to today and then go, cool, so what's the decision I need to make so that when, when people are talking about, you know, the contribution I made or whatever it is, uh, you know, on the day of my passing at my funeral, like what will they say? And how does this decision that I need to make today not put me in a situation where I'm retiring when I'm old and I can't do what I want to do anymore, that I'm sitting with a situation of regret? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I think, too, the only way that really can work is, and anything can work and, and it maintains and is sustainable, is, is happiness, right? Mm. So what makes anyone happy? And, and when you ask someone, you know, are you happy? And I cannot understand anyone who says they're not happy 24 seven. 
There are moments in life that are difficult, clearly. And there's a lot of struggle in life. But it's finding joy in the little things will put your life in perspective so that you are always happy because there is always something to be happy about, always. And then when you're a happy person, you're much more productive, you have a lot more energy, and you want to make other people happy. So you are, and tend to be more outwardly. Mm. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. I don't think chasing happiness is a is a fruitful exercise. I think, you know, uh, chasing for, well, I suppose you have to know what you're about, right? So for me, I'm like achievement driven. Like, um, and again, by the, by the way, going back to that stats form, I love that idea of putting pills on the necklace. You know what yeah, I'm saying? Yeah, 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 exactly. That's it. That's the concept. Like there always is some, there's an always a glass half full moment. Mm. Every single moment has some type of a positive. And I, and then many times, you know, I'll just think of if I'm having a crappy moment, I'll think about what is the one good thing? Okay, it smells good in here. That's the good thing, you know? Or <laughs> there's a nice breeze. Okay, it's very simple while this person's, you know, stabbing me, but it's okay. I feel like there's a good breeze. So I'm going to get through this, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I'm going to take those gloves on my wall and go punch something. That'll make me happy. <laughs> that, there you go. See, that's where I manifest. Yeah, I believe in the power of manifesting who you, not who you want to be, who you are. Yeah, absolutely. Well, so I feel like there's a whole other show we should do. Uh, yeah. But look, uh, we have run out of time. Thank you so much for being uh, with us on the show today, uh, Stephanie. I think what you're doing is is really difficult, and that's what makes it valuable. So, um, congrats to you and the rest of the team, and you know, excited to see where you guys are going to go in the future. Thank you for having us. We're very thrilled to be here, and appreciate your time. Anytime. Thanks, everybody. Ciao.